Hello and welcome to another episode of Boring History. My name is Angela and in a previous video I mentioned that the period of ancient Greece that I know the least about is the Hellenistic period. So of course I've done the logical thing and signed up for a unit this semester that focuses solely on the Hellenistic period. And this whole debacle explains today's video as I'm desperately trying to cram as much background information as I can so I don't sound like a complete idiot when class starts. So let's not waste any time and get started with who were the Diadochoi? And as per usual, in order to answer this question, we're going to begin with a little bit of background information. Alexander the Great is said to have died on the 11th of June, 323 BC. The way that he died, we're not going to discuss today. However, what we have readily available to us is quite a lot of source material that details the happenings that happened in the first couple of months following the death of Alexander. But never mind all that because we're just going to move on to the more easy stuff. For example, one of the biggest issues that popped up with the death of Alexander is that there wasn't a clear line of succession, mainly because he hadn't expected to die so soon. Why no life insurance company has decided to use this whole debacle as a marketing campaign, I have no idea. Because as I'm sure you can imagine, with no clear instructions on how to proceed, all these important and powerful-ish men were kind of running around like headless chickens trying to decide who should be boss. The men who were involved in this first round of struggle for power over Alexander's vast empire were known as the Diadochoi, or the successors. It should also be noted that all these men who were putting their hand up to be the new boss had all served with Alexander in some capacity. In other words, they weren't just random guys off the street who just suddenly decided that, hey, do you know what? Today feels like a great day to take over an empire. Oh, and also quickly, before I forget, Alexander did have one recognised son. However, the only problem was, at the time of his death, the son was still inside his mother's womb. So, logistically, it would have been an absolute nightmare to have him rule his father's kingdom. Which brings us back to the struggle of power between the Diadochoi. And this struggle lasted for more than 40 years, from 323 to 281 BC. And we also have to remember that Alexander's empire had been so huge that had a single man managed to come out on top and take over the entire empire, it would have been quite the feat. So instead what kind of happens is that this struggle for power between the Diadochoi is fought across a huge expanse of territory, including across Greece, the Mediterranean Sea, Iran, Egypt, India, and so on and so on. This division of real estate and struggle for power is actually also how all the individual Hellenistic kingdoms were formed. It has also been suggested that these Diadochoi may have thought that they were well within their rights to attempt to claim all these territories for themselves. This is because of a thing known as the principle of the victor to hold his spear one land. An ideology? Actually, is it an ideology? Do you know what? It doesn't matter. Let's just go with it. An ideology influenced largely by the fact that this is how Alexander had expressed his right to conquest. In particular, when he cast his spear from his ship into Asia whilst crossing the Hellespont in 334 BC. And if that line of thinking was good enough for Alexander, it was damn well good enough for the Diadochoi. So the successful Diadochi actually regarded themselves as the owners of their territory by right of military conquest. Now, of course, as with any good power struggle, there was a fair amount of wheeling and dealing that went on. Peace treaties were agreed on, alliances were broken, battles were fought, and just a whole heap of random nonsense happened that really succeeded only in bringing everyone to nowhere. Now, despite all this flurry of activity and all these different names and people that pop up all over the place, there are a couple of key figures that do come up on top. So let's have a look at some of these dudes. Now, first up, I just want to give an honourable mention to Perdiccas. Perdiccas had been a close childhood friend of Alexander, and it was said that he had been with him when he died. And more importantly, it's alleged that Alexander actually gave Perdiccas his signet ring, which, logically, you could assume to mean that Alexander Alexander wanted his friend to take over. And apparently the Macedonian army did offer Perdiccas the kingship, but because he was all like, look guys, I don't know, what do you guys think? Do you really think I should be king? Like, like maybe I should just act as regent until Alexander's son is born? Uh, I don't know. And generally he was just super indecisive until the offer just kind of rescinded unofficially into obscurity and Perdiccas just fades off into nothing. Which brings us to our first real contender of the Diadochoi. Antigonus Monopithalmus, maybe? 
Anyway, his name means the one-eyed because apparently he had lost an eye in battle. And you know what, despite that bout of bad luck in battle, he actually lived to the ripe old age of 81, which even by today's standards is a pretty good age to reach. There's also a bit of controversy around the social status of Antigonus' family. Some claim that his family were merely peasants, whilst others insisted that his family had strong links to the Macedonian royal house. Apparently, neither of these claims can be proven, and both are equally unlikely to be true. Instead, it's thought that his family were just some generic type of Macedonian nobility. But despite all that controversy, Antigonus had quite a successful military career under Alexander. For example, he commanded 7,000 Greek infantry that marched with Alexander when he crossed into Asia. And considering that the size of Alexander's entire Macedonian infantry for that mission was around 12,000 men, Antigonus actually commanded quite a significant chunk of those soldiers. With the death of Alexander, Antigonus eventually took control of Macedonia, including those parts of Greece that had been under Alexander's control. Now obviously it was a lot more complicated than that when Antigonus eventually took over, but instead of going into all of that, let's move on to Seleucus. Seleucus hit the jackpot territory-wise and ended up controlling a massive territory in the east which includes modern-day Iraq, Iran and Syria. But never mind all that boring stuff because out of all of the Diadochoi, he is by far the most interesting. He's a real rags to riches, riches to rags type of guys as he goes from being one of Alexander's mighty generals to a fugitive with little more than a horse to his name. And let's not forget the fact that he more or less founded a dynasty which lasted for around 300 years. A brief overview of Seleucus's life goes something like this. His father was said to be the god Apollo who had given his mother an iron ring which was engraved with an anchor. When Seleucus was born he was said to have a birthmark on his thigh that looked like an anchor. So you know, he was definitely the son of a god. Also, as an aside, this anchor birthmark is said to appear on all of his descendants. So if you've ever wondered why you've got a random anchor birthmark-like thing on your thigh, well, now you know. Anyway, apparently when Alexander died, his ghost visited Seleucus and was all like, Seleucus, you should be the king of Babylon. So Lucas agrees, he's like, yeah, you know what, I should be king. So he sets off to Babylon to take it back from the mighty Antigonus. So Lucas rocks up in Babylon and he's all like, hey, Antigonus, how you doing? Long time no see. And because Antigonus is a good host, he lets him hang in Babylon for a while. But apparently Antigonus eventually catches wind of Seleucus' plot to overthrow him, which is why Seleucus has to run away and becomes a fugitive for a little while. And I think he goes to Ptolemy in Egypt and asks for help there. Now what happens next involves a whole lot of omens and lightnings and stuff and probably needs its own video. But I will say there is a part in the story where Seleucus' son almost dies of a broken heart because he is so madly and deeply in love with his stepmother. So in other words, things get weird. And I think that means it's time to move on to the last of the Diadochoi that we'll be covering today. And this guy is somebody who I think the majority of people will be familiar with, Ptolemy. Ptolemy had not only been one of Alexander's generals, but had also been one of his childhood friends. This is also the guy from which the great Egyptian dynasty, the Ptolemy dynasty, gets its name from. It was Ptolemy who buried Alexander in Memphis, and then it was also Ptolemy who was like, actually, do you know what? I changed my mind digs up the body and transfers it over to Alexandria. Now understandably this removal of the body annoyed quite a few people and it's been suggested that maybe Ptolemy did this to substantiate his own right to rule. And there are scholars who agree and there are scholars who disagree with this reasoning. So if you're looking for an essay topic, why did Ptolemy move Alexander's body might be a good line of thought to go down. But anyway, after Ptolemy commandeered Alexander's body, he held funeral games and made sacrifices in honour of the dead king. And you know, I was going to make some sarcastic remark about how this makes all the grave robbing okay, but apparently by taking the body and then honouring it, quite a few soldiers then decided to join Ptolemy's cause. So maybe it did make it all okay. Ancient people are strange. Now obviously today we've just had a look at a few of the key players in the Battle of the Diadochi. A brief overview. A crash course on how to survive my first class. 
help. If you know any cool stories like the ones surrounding Sir Lucas, please feel free to share them in the comments down below because all this struggle for power nonsense can get a bit tedious if there aren't any random events or facts or happenings thrown into the middle of it. Thank you so much for joining me today and helping me prepare for my first class. Like I said, anything you would like to share, feel free to put it in the comments down below and please consider subscribing because I'm going to need your help as I move forward and share even more boring history in the future.